And of course, uh, how important that is and, and uh, what we owe the government, uh, what their purpose is. God instituted civil government. He's the one that, that uh, raises up, the Bible says, and pulls down. He's still talking about relationships. Talked about our relationship uh, to government. Now he talks about our relationship to those around us. In chapter 13, verse 8, no, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment <coughs> of the law. And we mentioned about a neighbor and... Remember the parable about who is my neighbor, the Good Samaritan. Uh, anybody that needs something is a neighbor. So anybody close by, anybody that you have contact with, anybody that is, uh, is near you in any way is a neighbor. So our relationship to our neighbors. Um, and especially, he says... You owe no one anything except to love one another. That's what we have an obligation. All right? And I think I mentioned last week about how we have an obligation to pay a debt that we owe. Like if we buy a car, buy a house, we have an obligation to pay that. And when we pay it, that obligation is met. But we can never meet that obligation for loving our neighbor. In other words, it's a continual obligation. We will always have that obligation to love our neighbor. Uh, the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, talks about how God's people are to love their neighbor. It's not anything new. And this love here is the agape love. So it's whatever our neighbor, whatever is best for our neighbor, whatever is, is his, in his or her best interest. And of course, ultimately, that's about their salvation. We should be concerned about other people's eternal destiny. And that's what's important. So if we really want to fulfill the law, the law that says love your neighbor as yourself then we're, we're not going to be selfless. We're, we're not, I mean, we're not going to be selfish. We're going to be selfless. We're going to be concerned about uh, other people, uh, how we treat them. And as he says, we're not to, uh, love does no harm to a neighbor. There, you know, we don't do any, uh, no ill will, no hatred, no, no evil, you know, nothing wicked or bad. Uh, anything like that uh, at all. And then he says, and do this. And do this. Verse 11. Knowing the time that now it's high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Do this. He says, know the time. He says it's high time. It's high time. Um, time is quickly passing. It was passing quickly for the Romans in the first century. It's passing quickly for us. It's very limited. We have very limited time. Uh, for, you know, regardless of how old we are, we have a very limited time. And we want to make sure we don't waste it. We need to realize what's important and take care of what's, out, what's important. He says it's a time to wake out of sleep. It's not time, you know, the time here on earth is not a time to be lazy or slothful or unconcerned. We've got to be concerned about people, busy about doing what's right because we have such limited time. 
Even if we have 70 years in front of us, that's, that's limited time and it goes by fast. So he says, realize that you need to wake out of sleep because there's not much time left. Regardless of who you are, there's not much time left. Young or old or middle aged or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. You need to awaken, arouse, you know. Uh, you need to be aroused out of being uh, um, slothful. It's not time to sleep. It's time to be awake. It's time to be watchful. It's time to be uh, taking action because time, he says, is quickly passing. He says our salvation is nearer than we, when we first believed. And again, regardless of when that was, our salvation is nearer than when we first became a Christian. Whether that was a few months ago or many, many years ago. We are nearer our salvation in so many different ways. So that's why I need to wake myself up. Oh, I think there's a car out there. Yep, there's somebody at the door. Oh, it's Dean. It's unlocked. Wait till you hit 80, Bobby, and then you'll think, hey, I really don't have that. <clears throat> there he is. Reckon that was them about to go to them? I thought I heard them. Well, we called them too, but we could <laughs> Then nobody came up to the door. <laughs> I didn't hear anything, so. Well, hi there, Dean. How are you? I was new here. You want to go back in class? Okay. Whoops. Hi. The far one? Everybody, quit talking about Dean. Now, let's stop. We've said enough. He's going to have to make him be aged. That is not going to happen. I think, I think he just hit over. He, what? I think he hit over. Oh. I don't doubt it. I do not doubt it. Get a ruler. <laughs> We're in Romans 13. Romans 13. <clears throat> we were just starting to look at verse 11 and 12. In verse 12 it says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Again, it's about time. It's about time. He says, let's cast off, let's, let's get rid of anything that's dark. And of course in the Bible there's always this distinction between light and dark. Darks always represented sin and immorality and wickedness and evil. And lights always represented good and holiness and purity, things that are good and right. So he says, <clears throat> since the day the night is far spent, again, time is passing, much time is passing. On the alert and thinking about, like he told the Ephesians, uh, redeem the time. We need to use up that time very wisely. So, and put on. So, darkness. God's word is. And so, light represents and righteousness and justice all that's good and then he says let us walk properly let us walk properly 
not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and So he says, first of all, your walk, your conduct, all right, is to be becoming, is to be proper. With decency, the word means. Let your conduct be that of decency. Propriety. Propriety. A becoming manner. And of course he contrasts day and night. It seems like so much wrong happens at night. In the darkness. And I think that's been the way it is since the beginning of time. Daylight. Pretty good, but come night and darkness, and that's when the evil comes out with a lot of people. And I think that's what he's talking about here. He says, walk properly as in the day, because that's how you should walk. But he says, not in revelry. Uh, this word has the idea of, uh, of uh, the wrong kind of merrymaking, the wrong kind of feasting, the wrong kind of uh, fun. You know, there's a good kind of fun, the bad kind of fun. This, this word means the bad kind of fun. It's one of the uh, uh, works of the flesh that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. Same word, revelings. It's, uh, uh, it's a word that often accompanies like drunken parties. So he says... Not in those type of activities. Um, and he says, not in drunkenness. Not in strong drink. There's so much, and I mentioned this more than once, there's so many places in the Bible that tell us to stay away completely from strong drink. Because it has so many bad effects. It loosens people's self-control. And so we don't think as clearly. And that's why when people start to drink, they do things that they normally would not. Well, that tells us for Christians we shouldn't ever take any drink because we're going to start, you know, there's no point where somebody is drunk that he's not drunk the drink before. In other words, one drink doesn't make somebody more drunk than he was before. So there's not some nice little mark, oh well, I can drink up to this point because I'm not drunk. Not true. Not true at all. So that very first drink starts you on the road to losing control, losing the ability to think clearly. It, it loosens your moral restraints. That's why so many bad things happen when people drink. But I know in my lifetime, uh, I've never seen more so-called religious people think that it's just fine to drink. And I think you can blame that on the Budweiser commercials, the, uh, all those commercials that, that really promotes any type of drinking, whether it's wine or beer or whatever. Anything with, with that kind of alcohol. Uh, because that's what it does. It, it causes you to not think clearly. And if, you, if you're around people that drink, you can sure see the difference when they start to drink. The, the, their mind does not work like it does when they're sober. And that alone is a reason for Christians to stay away from it. Uh, Denise, Denise had put, uh, had forwarded some article about uh, not drinking at all. And I don't remember where it came from. Might have been one of David's articles. I don't remember. But she put it on Facebook. One of her former students came back and basically disagreed with everything she had said. And it was really interesting. And this is how she justified it okay being uh, drink. What, uh, I don't remember what verse she was quoted. What, whatever God has made, we should be thankful for it. And I thought, well, if that's true, 
then it would be okay for me to take any poisons that are out there. You know, poisonous mushrooms. And a lot of poisonous mushrooms will be... They use for marijuana. Uh-huh. God made this, so it's going to be... Good. If, if it's something in the world, then it's fine. And that was exactly her reason. And she said, well, that, this is a more modern way to interpret it. No, it's the wrong way to interpret it. Uh, but we didn't respond because, you know, why it wouldn't have done any good. You know, but that that's the idea here when he talks about uh, not in revelry and drunkenness. Those things tend to go together. Those things tend to go together. And like I mentioned, they they have for a long time. But those things make uh, they 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 loosen up again those moral restraints, and that's why so many things happen. When people start to drink, um, I think they have medical proof too that alcohol kills the brain cells. Oh yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. I mean, immediately it starts to do just what we were talking about. Just immediately, it starts to affect your brain, regardless of you know when people talk about well I can hold my liquor. Nobody can hold their liquor. It it starts to affect everybody from the first drink. But uh, go ahead. Well, same thing. Marijuana affects your. If you've been around people that smoke marijuana, it it affects their brains. They don't think. They all want to say that that's so much less.